Okay, so um, uh, my name is Rafael and I'm a, a junior professor here at the Vanderbilt. Um, I started my lab uh, almost a year and a half ago. And uh, um, I decided to take this chance to talk about my work and, and present uh, a mix of published and unpublished data um, and uh, show what, you know, what, um, how you can use uh, correlated microscopy pipelines to uh, address questions of cellular longevity, but then also I, I'm going to show data that you know it, it's currently unpublished, but it's relevant to all the DK community, and and also um, showing how uh, correlated microscopy can be used to look at turnover of macromolecular complexes. All of this uh, in, in in tissues. So um, the overall, the, the I guess the the, the large umbrella of my lab is basically trying to understand how cells that remain largely, largely post-mitotic throughout our lifetime, how do they maintain their function and identity? So I, I, I think this, this, this started with the recognition that basically, um, you know, cells that are largely post-mitotic and, and, and I think neurons are, are, are a very good example, but there are many other cell types in the body that do the same thing, but that basically these cells don't have very little uh, or almost no regenerative capacity. And from the moment that they're, that they're born until the moment that we die, they actually need to maintain their function and identity for several decades. And, and if, if we're lucky, those cells are gonna live for almost a century and, and they need to go through life and, and deal with, with aging um, uh, in, a, in a different way than, for instance, cells that are actively proliferating or cells that might have a, 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 uh, um, the capacity to regenerate. And uh, with aging, we, know, we now know that there are several different aspects of aging that impact pretty much every different compartment of the cell. And we also know that aging is associated with the declining function of different cells and organs. And usually the diseases that are um, uh, uh, degenerative in, in nature or that uh, cause metabolic problems in, in our aging bodies are usually associated with largely post-mitotic organs. Um, so what my lab is trying to do is basically to understand how cells are, uh, or specifically how long-lived cells uh, go through life and how cell longevity and homeostasis are maintained under steady state conditions in health and then how those mechanisms are affected by disease. And the, the long-term goal of the lab is to learn from these long-lived cells and understand where the first problems of aging arise in these cells so we can actually identify or, and, and pinpoint these, these areas to try to repair or even protect those tissues from age-related functional decline. Now, uh, I just wanna give you a, a, a quick historical context on, on, on the idea of longevity. Um, and uh, well, I'll, I'm just gonna tell you a story from the 1940s that up until that decade, uh, most scientists believed that, that the body, uh, you know, that the human body or the, or the body of, an, of a, uh, uh, any animal, was basically the result of an accumulated uh, uh, material through their entire life. So basically proteins and cells would not turn over, they would simply accumulate. Um, and then basically they would suffer from wear and tear. And basically that's what aging was, was the wear and tear of, of, of these accumulated structures. And there was very little evidence of, of uh, biological turnover, mainly because uh, at the time, uh, uh, you know, society lacked the, the, the technology to actually see it. And that changed when uh, Harold Urey and his colleagues up in, uh, I think that they were in New York at the time, um, uh, Harold basically came up with the idea of, and, and the method to isolate stable isotopes. Now these are non-radioactive isotopes that by definition stay stable, um, uh, you know, uh, all, all the time. And basically Harold figured out how to enrich uh, for nitrogen-15, which was one of the first uh, biologically relevant stable isotopes to be isolated. Um, and he isolated enough of nitrogen-15 that he was able to synthesize nitrogen-15, leucine, and glycine. And he basically fed that to, to rats for three days. And he, I, I, I believe it's one of the first post-labeling experiments in rats 
where basically he created uh, uh, rats that, were, that accumulated nitrogen-15 uh, from nutrients over three days. And at the end of those three days, they basically analyzed different parts of the animal body and the secreted uh, uh, product. And basically he saw that only about 30% of the nitrogen-15 was secreted and most of it was retained in the body. But this idea that there was secretion going on suggested that there was some kind of turnover going on or, or what they called in, in 1942, basically the metabolic regeneration of uh, uh, protein-based or nitrogen-based elements in the body. Now, fast forward to 2013 and a former colleague of mine, Brendan Toyama at the SALK, he, made, he basically um, uh, uh, made the discovery that there are proteins and he identified proteins that are remarkably long-lived. And the way that he did that was actually using a very similar uh, paradigm to what Harold uh, and his colleagues developed in the, in the 40s in the sense that you create mice that are labeled with nitrogen-15 through diet. So nitrogen-15 goes everywhere. It goes into nucleic acids, goes into uh, a protein, and it, it goes into basically any molecule that contains, molecule, uh, that, that contains nitrogen in the body. And then after that mouse is labeled, you chase that mouse with nitrogen-14 containing food. And uh, the rationale here is that anything that it's created or synthesized in the body um, during this N15 labeling period, if it's retained at the end of the, of the chase period, it is by definition a long-lived element. And uh, at that time, uh, Brandon basically uh, was focused in using mass spec and he took, the, he took whole brains and whole livers and ground, ground that tissue up. And then he did tissue fractionation to isolate different compartments of the cell followed by mass spec. And I, I just want to highlight that this idea of looking at nitrogen 15 after long periods of chase is very similar to what, uh, to what you know, scientists have been doing for uh, dating um, uh, the age of, of trees or cells or, or um, cells in the human body looking for carbon-14. And that was also developed in, uh, in, the, in the 40s and 50s by Libby and Arnold. Um, but most importantly, what Brandon discovered was that there was a class of proteins that were retained for at least six to 12 months in the human body without significant, uh, sorry, in, in the mouse body without significant turnover. And most of those proteins were located in the nucleus. So they were in, uh, so they were different uh, species of histones. They were also in the nuclear pore complex. Some of them were in the extracellular matrix. Uh, some of them were actually on the, uh, uh, in the myelin sheaths of, of neurons. And some other ones were uh, of, uh, uh, um, uh, they were enzymes, and, and I'm going to mention one of those, uh, one of these examples uh, in, a, in a minute. But basically, most of them were located in the nucleus. And we started thinking when I joined the lab, uh, we started thinking actually what was the distribution of, of these long lived proteins in situ. Um, the, only, the only spatial resolution that we had was that we knew where this data was coming from, that it was from whole brains or whole livers. And then most importantly, because we know that these long-lived proteins become damaged over time and they lose their function, are there other cells that contain long-lived proteins? And by definition, those cells would also, uh, uh, are also expected to be long-lived cells and therefore more likely to suffer from uh, age-dependent damage. Now, as I said, at that time, these experiments had a very low spatial resolution beyond uh, the identity of where uh, the data came from. So we started thinking about how can we actually test the age of tissues uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in organs using microscopy. And, and my background, it's mostly in, uh, um, in islets of Langerhans. And uh, I immediately thought about islets because they contain uh, three major cell types um, namely beta, alpha, and delta cells. And together they regulate glucose homeostasis. But most importantly for the problem in question that we had at that time was that you can easily identify these cell types using multiple microscopy pipelines. You can use confocal microscopy or electron microscopy. And it's relatively straightforward to look at an islet and identify cell types. Now here I'm showing you four micrographs of alpha, beta, delta, and endothelial cells. And we can classify these cells based on their uh, uh, on, on the appearance of their granular content. But in the pancreas, there are also other cell types such as ductal cells, which are epithelial cells, fibroblasts, and also acinar cells, uh, which compose most of the organ, in fact. Now, there's also at, 
there's also a lot of data you know, talking about the rate of beta cell proliferation. And we know that the rate of beta cell proliferation is relatively low. And we also know that that rate of proliferation tends to go down with age. So this, this um, historical data uh, basically set the stage with, with the idea that we had that basically, well, if at any given point, there's about between one or 3% of beta cells are actually actively um, uh, expressing KI67, which suggests that they might be dividing. At any given day, you're gonna have beta cells that are old or and beta cells that are relatively younger. So it creates this uh, uh, mosaicism of age, of, of cells with different ages that we thought this was actually a very good place to start to look at, at, at the question of long-lived cells. So, so basically that's what we did. We, we started asking what's the longevity of these islet cells uh, and also of the exocrine cells. Now the pancreas, it's, it, it, it's, it's a very exciting organ, but it's very difficult to study specifically with electron microscopy because islets are very small. They have about 150 microns in diameter on average, but they only compose about 2% of the entire uh, organ mass. So first, if we wanted to look at the, at if, we, if you actually wanna look at islets with electron microscopy, first you need to find them uh, in, uh, in tissue blocks. And then after we found these islets, we would have to figure out a way, how do we quantify time in a retrospective manner? So how do you tell the age of a cell after an animal has aged for like two years or, or its entire lifetime? So to address the, the, the first problem, which is the, uh, three-dimensional problem in finding islets, we basically develop a pipeline that basically can take any block of tissue and you can find specific regions within that tissue first using, oops, sorry, first using x-ray microscopy. So you're basically doing x-ray to non-invasively identify structures within different tissue blocks. And here I'm just showing you a snapshot of what an islet looks like under the x-ray. And you can basically see that uh, islets have a, a, a different contrast to the rest of the tissue. Once you know where those islets are in the block, basically you have an x, a y, and a depth coordinate. So you're able to basically trim down the block up until you're at the edge of that islet. And then from, now on, from, from there onwards, you can basically take sections of, of that islet specifically or you can trim the block and do serial block face electron microscopy, which is this example right here that I'm showing you in the sense that you can basically acquire uh, several hundreds of images of electron microscopy in a, in a volumetric um, uh, basis. So you're able now to understand what's the context of that islet within the larger context of the organ, but now you're actually able to interrogate the structure of that islet and of the cells in that islet um, uh, with electron microscopy resolution. Now, this allows you to identify different cell types. So as I said, we can identify beta cells, we can identify alpha cells based on their granular identity. Um, and if you really want to push the resolution and, and, and go a step further and really look at these cells in, in high detail, you're able to take sections from these blocks um, in, in a very coordinated manner and then uh, use them for electron tomography. So you're basically able to go from a micrometer based tissue block up to nanometer resolution images of specific regions, all while maintaining spatial uh, uh, information. So we are also able to use deep learning uh, uh, algorithms to do segmentation of, of electron microscopy volumes. And, and this is one example where basically we used AI to do uh, a segmentation of the mitochondrial network of that islet that I just showed you, uh, scan with serial block phase. And basically, it, it's going to zoom in in, in in a second, but basically what you're seeing here is that in green, you have individual mitochondria identified in that volume. And then the different colors identify specific cells that we uh, uh, did the segmentation. And here you can see that we can very easily now infer the structure of these cells in a spatial context. So you can basically reconstruct these cells and their organelles in three dimensions. And we can basically quantify these aspects. And we can learn, for instance, that beta cells tend to have a, 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 um, a, a a vast heterogeneity in, in their mitochondrial content, for example, while alpha and delta cells tend to be a little bit more um, um, 
um, a, a little bit less uh, variable in, in their mitochondrial content. Now, basically what I've shown so far covers the idea that you can go from a, a tissue block down to a cell or even organelles in space, but that doesn't answer the second problem, which was how do you tell time? So to do that, we took advantage of another imaging technology called multi-isotope imaging, um, uh, which basically it's, a, uh, it's analogous to what an imaging mass spec does. But instead of looking using light to, 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 to basically identify peptides and, and, and lipid uh, uh, elements in the tissue, you're basically using a cesium beam to, to sputter secondary ions and look at, at the elemental composition of the tissue. And the way that it works is that we had used, used the same paradigm that Harold and then Brandon used to create nitrogen-15 labeled mice. And we had mice that were basically labeled early on in their life and chased for up to 26 months with nitrogen-14. And basically the cohort that I had to start with was these long-lived mice where nitrogen 15 alone would be retained only in very, very old structures. Now, the going in, the rationale was that we would find nitrogen 15 in the DNA of neurons because those cells are born early on and do not turn over, uh, most of them do not turn over. And we were also expecting to see um, uh, labeling of nitrogen 15 in the nerve fibers, specifically in the myelin sheaths uh, in the axons. So uh, the way that it works is that we basically got tissue sections from the brain, the pancreas, and the liver, and we put them through a MEMS microscope. Now, this, my, this specific microscope is, is, is uh, one of the main ones that, that we're using, and it's in, uh, it's in Pasadena at the Caltech um, uh, Center. And basically, this is the very same machine that uh, JPL actually uses to measure stable isotopes in stardust. And they use a correlate of nitrogen 15, and, nitrogen 15 and other stable isotopes as correlates for the age of stars in, in, in the universe. So we're using the very same rationale, quantifying nitrogen 15 in these tissues to basically estimate the age of cells. And then I'm gonna show you how we do that for organelles and then how we do that for protein super complexes. So as I said, MEMS uses a cesium beam to rock over the tissue and slowly ionize these, um, the, these different ions that are on, on the surface of the tissue. And if you have an N15 labeled tissue, that means that you're able to separate and sputter uh, nitrogen 15 and nitrogen 14. So basically MEMS reconstructs these images on a pixel by pixel basis. And basically where you find nitrogen 15, over, where you find predominantly nitrogen 15, it means that you're looking at an old structure. If you have a, a pixel or a region of the tissue that has a lot more nitrogen 15 than nitrogen 15, you're looking at a, at a structure that, that is relatively young, meaning that that part of the tissue was regenerated or it was synthesized during the N14 chase period. So when you look at a brain section, you find exactly what we were expecting to find, which is basically a lot of nitrogen-15 in the nucleus of these neurons and a lot of nitrogen-15 in these uh, uh, spaghetti-like structures, which if you look at the EM, it's, it's overlaying with myelin. So this image and the series of experiments basically validated um, that technology could be used to measure N15 on in these tissues, that it could be correlated with electron microscopy, and that we were finding nitrogen 15 where it was supposed to, or, or where it was expected to be. So then we moved on out of the brain, because we were actually, our initial question was hunting for long-lived cells in somatic tissues. So we went back to the pancreas, and this is a cross-section of that volumetric islet that I showed uh, earlier during my talk. And this islet is from a mouse that was labeled nitrogen 15 until 45 days of, of postnatal life, and then chased with nitrogen 14 for 18 months. So when we did MEMS of that same section, surprisingly, we found that were, there was actually a gradient of nitrogen 15 throughout the islet. But to my surprise, we actually found islets that had as much nit nitrogen 15, and these are the islets that I'm hovering over here with my indicator, that had as much nitrogen 15 as neurons of the brain. So this, this was 
shocking to us initially because we were expecting a, a slow but continuous rate of turnover of these beta cells. So we were expecting to see some nitrogen 15, but not as much as in neurons of the brain. And uh, we also saw that some exocrine cells of the pancreas were also as old as neurons of the brain. But uh, the other feature that we found was that there was this gradient, there were these cells that basically had a mix of N14 and N15 in their, in their DNA. And basically these cells are the ones that did go through uh, uh, different stages of the cell cycle and replicated. And basically as cells that are labeled nitrogen 15, eventually once their DNA is replicated, it's synthesized with nitrogen 14 and you eventually dilute the amount of nitrogen 15 you have in the nucleus. So basically you, we can quantify how many times each cell divided by estimating how much nitrogen 15 is left in each individual nuclei. So we also, and this is basically shown in, in this inset where basically we have four cells. You have an alpha cell here on the top right and you have three beta cells over here. But once we look at the amount of nitrogen 15 each of these cells have in their nuclei, you can see that this alpha cell right here and this beta cell contain a lot of nitrogen 15 and, and I can, these cells actually have as much nitrogen 15 as um, uh, neurons of the brain. And then you have these two cells down here that have lost almost uh, all nitrogen 15. And, and basically they have gone down to what we call back, you know, our background level. So they're, be, they're beyond detection, meaning that these cells replicated so many X many times that they lost all their nitrogen 15. So this, I, I really like this snapshot because it shows basically how you can have cells within the same vicinity of the islet with vastly different uh, um, uh, turnover rates or um, uh, histories of, of, of their uh, turnover behavior. And we also identified that delta cells are among uh, one of the oldest cells in, in, in the pancreas, but then also across the mouse body. And I'm gonna show more data uh, of other digestive tissues where we also see long-lived cells in a second. But when you put all this data together, and again, taking this data in context of the levels that you find of N15 in uh, uh, neurons of the brain, we find that roughly 60% of all beta cells are as old as neurons. And then you have a population of beta cells that we call them relatively young, which means that these are the cells that in the span of 18 months, these are the cells that actually replicated. And you have a smaller fraction of alpha cells that do engage in replication at the same time. And um, up to this date, and we, we, have, repeat, we have generated at least two different uh, N15 uh, uh, animal cohorts, and we still have to see delta cells show any sign of significant turnover in adult mice. Um, now, the, the interesting thing was that we were able to narrow down when these cells become post-mitotic, because we also had mice that were labeled only until P21 instead of P45. And basically P21 is, is when mice are being weaned and then th there's an important metabolic change that happens specifically for, uh, uh, for, for beta cells, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. But weaning is expected to trigger beta cell proliferation, some beta cell proliferation and maturation that it's gonna be important to set up uh, the, the adult Fun, uh, the adult phenotype of beta cells in mice. And that's exactly what we saw. So we saw that basically, if you labeled mice up to 21 uh, days of age, and then you chase them for roughly two years, you see that most alpha cells and beta cells actually show signs of replication. But surprisingly, we found a population of alpha and beta cells that, that remain post-mitotic and were basically already post-mitotic by P21. So this suggests that there is a fraction of beta cells and alpha cells that is born before weaning and becomes post-mitotic before the animal is, is weaned and, is, and it does not proliferate after, uh, uh, after weaning. And then again, we, we still have to find a delta cell that shows any signs of um, uh, replication uh, uh, in, in the mouse islet. So as, I, as I've been uh, uh, mentioning, this pipeline or this 
this collection of, of microscopy tools is co it's co uh, correlative. So basically we can look at the same cell with different technologies and that applies also to that uh, volumetric information that I, that, that volumetric experiment that I showed. So we can take now the MEMS data from that, from these cells and put it in context of that 3D volume that I showed at the beginning of the talk. So we can see where basically every beta cell is, where there is a delta cell there, where alpha cells are. Um, and we're actually able now to correlate the age of cells or basically how much nitrogen 15 each beta cell has with their mitochondrial fraction. And what we're finding out is that the cells that have the highest levels of nitrogen 15, meaning these are the oldest cells, they tend to have uh, 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 more mitochondrial volume than uh, uh, cells that have less nitrogen 15. So now basically this leads to our current working model where we have, uh, where we expect, you know, to have an adult beta cell that at some point in time makes a decision to either become largely post-mitotic and then long-lived or engages in, into a slow uh, uh, proliferation uh, behavior. And basically these are the cells that would go on and contribute to maintenance of beta cell mass under steady state. Now, it's possible that the, the decision of, of these beta cells during adulthood is modulated by changes in nutrient composition and or demand for cell function. And this is a question that we're actively looking at. But it's also interesting because we found now, our studies suggest that there are other beta cells during development and before weaning that actually take the long lived track. So it's possible that even though most beta cells, when they shift from a milk based diet to carbohydrate based diet after weaning, most beta cells do engage in, in, in some level of proliferation and maturation. We, our data suggests that there are beta cells that follow a different track. And then those are the cells, those are really old beta cells um, but their identity and their nature is something that we're actively looking at. And specifically now we're actually curious, you know, what, what is the earliest date that, that we see these long-lived beta cells being born? So um, before I, I jump into the unpublished part of the talk, I just want to tell you what's going on in the lab. And we're asking now, you know, we're trying to un uh, uh, understand what's the functional profile and the physio physiological role of these long-lived beta cells. And, and basically, is there any, does it matter if a beta cell is old or young? Do they actually have any functional differences? Um, and then are there ways that we can enhance or even modulate beta cell longevity? Um, and uh, as I said, what's the earliest time point when long-lived beta cells are born? And then basically what determines if a beta cell will be long-lived or not? I mean, what's, what's the trigger and what, what's the, what's the the transcriptional events that actually um, contribute to beta cells making a decision to be long-lived or not. Um, so, but as I said, um, you know, I, I think beta cells are, are awesome cells to study, but they're not unique in their longevity. So uh, at the same way that, that the neurons of the brain are not unique in their longevity, and I just showed the case for different cell types in, in, in the pancreas, we, once we knew that we had a tool that could, act, that could reliably tell if a cell was, uh, was long-lived or not, we basically started uh, a, a large survey of different tissues uh, throughout, uh, throughout, um, uh, uh, throughout different mice. And I'm gonna show you some examples here. So basically, um, we, the next one that I tried to look for long-lived cells was the kidney. And to my surprise, we uh, basically um, uh, start looking at the glomeruli, and then I'm also gonna show data from the ducts. But basically we can see that most different cell types in the kidney, uh, and this is from a six month uh, old mouse. So basically cells that were born and then remained in place without turnover for six months. You can see that most cells here actually have as much N N15 as neurons. And you can even find long lived cells outside the glomeruli and also in the inter interstitial space near the tubule, uh, sorry, near, um, near the tubule um, uh, structures. So, but we also see that the uh, tubule, tubules contain cells with different levels of nitrogen 15, suggesting that turnover in these structures is also very heterogeneous. Now, um, the other tissue we went on to was actually the small intestine. 
And here we were basically trying to find the opposite, right? We were trying to basically see um, if we had, uh, if we could find a tissue that had a complete washout of the N15. So basically a tissue that proliferates so often that you wouldn't find any N15 in anywhere. And again, to our surprise, we found that, uh, for instance, when you're looking at the small intestine villi, where basically in the periphery or on the outside, you have the epithelial cells that basically have a lifetime of roughly seven days. So they're actively pro proliferating and new cells are being born at the bottom of the villi. Um, and as you would expect, all those cells in the periphery of the villi are, or the, all those epithelial cells are young cells. So you don't find any N15 there, so which was a good validation for us. But to our surprise, we found that actually the long-lived cells in the intestine are located inside the villi. So, so basically where you have the blood vessels and where you have fibroblasts, those cells are long-lived. And then basically those are cells that can stay for, for, for several months in the intestine without significant turnover. But uh, we have also shown that hepatocytes can be remarkably long-lived. Now we have also data showing that cells in the lung are long -lived, can be long-lived. There are also old cells in the spleen and also there are old cells in the skin. Now the skin, just like the intestine, has a high proliferating uh, epithelial layer, which is here at where my mouse is at, but, you do, but you're also expected to have stem cells that basically give rise to these uh, um, to, to, to basically these proliferating epithelial cells. And here in these squares, I'm basically highlighting two different cells that are embedded below the epithelial cell layer and that are um, of different ages. And all this uh, uh, intense signal that you see surrounding these cells, these are all collagen fibers that are also uh, uh, among the, the oldest molecules that, that we can actually find in the in the mouse body. And that's throughout all these different tissues. All this signal here in the hepatocytes, um, these are some uh, ductal cells, but also collagen. And then here in the kidney, you can also appreciate that the filtering membrane or the basal membrane is also rich in nitrogen 15, suggesting that there's limited turnover of those regions. And then also here in the, in the uh, collagen fibers wrapping around the proximal tubules, you can also see nitrogen 15. So basically we're starting to see this pattern where, where basically you have long-lived cells, you have cells that are, have, are somewhat middle-aged, and then basically cells that are relatively young. But then the same rationale would apply to uh, 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 macromolecular structures of the body. And that's what I'm gonna show uh, next. So as I said, uh, Brendan's paper basically showed that there were some proteins that were outside the nucleus that could be long-lived. And one of those proteins, which uh, it, was, uh, it was located in the mitochondria, and that's where we actually went out hunting next. So we uh, started looking at the brain because that's, that's where the tissue where we had most of the mass spec data for. And we started looking at uh, different parts of the brain. And this example that I'm showing here, it's basically, it's from a very recent publication where we basically show that neurons of in the cerebellum have mitochondria with different ages. And what we saw was basically that there were bundles of mitochondria in neurons that had significantly more nitrogen 15 than, the, than mitochondria inside the same cell. So now this started raising the possibility that there are some mitochondria in the central nervous system that um, that are maintained for longer periods of time. And this, again, this is from one of those mice that were actually chased for six months. Now, long-lived mitochondria are not exclusive to the brain because we also found them in different types of muscle fibers. And then again, we saw that there was a heterogeneity of mitochondrial age, whether those mitochondria were in the uh, axon part of the uh, incoming nerve of the muscle fiber, or whether those mitochondria were directly below the, the nerve terminal, or if they were actually in the fiber. So basically that showed to us that organelles also have vastly different longevities. Now, we also were able to show that, um, that one of the proteins that Brendan identified with his mass spec technology was basically located in the scaffold of nuclear pore complexes. 
So we went out and then we, we, we decided to test whether the technology could actually show pores, uh, uh, old pores in, in the central nervous system. So we again basically went to our uh, N15 labeled mouse cohort. And then we started looking for nuclear pores. And uh, basically the approach here is that most for most of, most of my time doing electron microscopy, I've seen nuclear pores this way, where you're, you're basically cutting them sideways and you're basically seeing the gap in the uh, uh, nuclear envelope membrane. But basically this is how the pore is organized. And the long-lived proteins were actually located in the scaffold, in the membrane scaffold of the pore complex. So one thing that I didn't mention is that the isotope imaging has a resolution of about 50 to 80 nanometers. Um, so basically, if we were trying to measure nitrogen 15 in pores cut that were actually cut this way, we wouldn't have enough um, uh, area of the pore to actually resolve with the MIMS technology. So the approach that we took, it was that basically we would have to see the pore from the top. So the pore has about a 200 nanometer diameter. Um, so it was the best way for us to actually have enough area off the pore um, to be able to resolve it with this uh, isotope imaging uh, tech. So, th and this is what you're seeing here. So you're basically seeing a nucleus of a neuron. And this is very close to the, to the cap of that nucleus. And the reason that we went for the cap is because you can make sections that basically are trimming the nuclear envelope, which is this thick uh, flat membrane looking like structure, which is then gonna be dotted with the pores that are at that cap position. And you're actually able to see the pore from the top. So as if you're about to go through the pore into the nucleus. And when we did MEMS of, of these different regions, we actually saw these large uh, uh, bubbles coming off from uh, the, the the nuclear envelope that overlaid with individual nuclear pores. And what we were also able to see was that there were pores that had some indication of turnover. And we were, with other technologies, uh, um, we, uh, we and artists were able to show that there are mechanisms for pores to be removed and, re and, and replaced in cells without entering the cell cycle. But this again, it's another piece of evidence that basically showing that even large complexes or organelles that are, are in these post mitotic cells can have uh, vastly different longevities. So the last one that I'm gonna show is actually in beta cells. So we're coming back to beta cells. And when we were uh, analyzing the data for, for the N15 um, uh, islet, we started noticing that some islets had these hot spots of nitrogen 15 in their cytoplasm. So usually, beta cells don't have any N15 in their cytoplasm. It's mostly in their nuclei. But these things start calling our attention because they were located close to the plasma membrane and they were overlapping with these structures that look like a star-shaped structure. Now we didn't have the perfect angle to look at this and then they, these were actually from consecutive sections so we weren't really sure, but what the star-shaped structure looked like, it looked a lot like the basal body of cilia. So it looked actually like this region right here, which is close to the transition zone. So we went after uh, uh, more sections of beta cells and looking for the, 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 the best cut of cilia, uh, but it was actually just like the pore that it was actually on a longitudinal axis. So we would have enough parts of the cilia under the microscope to be able to analyze it, but also so we could see it in context with the cilia itself from the transition zone and then from the basal body. So that's what you're seeing. Uh, this is what this, um, these two micrographs are. So these are serial sections of a basal body and the cilia of a beta cell that was labeled nitrogen 15 until P21. So a very, very, very old beta cell that was basically in the same place for two years. And here you can see different parts of the cilia. You can see the transition zone up here and here you can see more of the basal body itself. And when we measured the amount of nitrogen 15, we found that actually the basal body contains two, two to three times more 
nitrogen 15 above background. So that implies that this part of the basal body specifically was retained or contains long-lived proteins that need yet to be identified. So when we take everything together and then we, we uh, all these different patterns of longevity that I mentioned, we came up with, with a, a, a hypothesis that uh, of a basic organization pattern that relies on the temporal re resilience of specific elements. So we call that age mosaicism, mainly because we, we, we started seeing many different elements uh, of different ages that were forming these mosaics in protein complexes, such as the nuclear pore or the primary cilium, but also we, we, we saw mitochondria of different ages. Then you have cells that have vastly different longevities as well. Each of these cells, they form multicellular structures which in itself can have vastly different longevities and basically their own aging signatures, which build up this atlas of tissues that have um, cells that have vastly different longevity. So, so, it's, it, so it's a multi-scale organization pattern based on differential turnover rates across scales. Now, why would you have this? Like what, what is the, the advantage to the cell to actually have long-lived structures? So our leading hypothesis right now is that these long-lived structures, they are pillars that basically stabilize and provide a kind of like a, a biological GPS of sorts to uh, a relatively younger uh, entities. So for instance, in the nuclear pore complex, all the long-lived proteins are located within the inside ring of the pore, which is embedded in the plasma membrane. So we hypothesize that basically the short-lived proteins that are on the outside and that are frequently replaced actually could use these long-lived proteins as scaffolds or basically as a guiding point to where these proteins should be inserted uh, once they are replaced. But it could also work on the eventual case when you have one of these long-lived proteins that becomes damaged and needs to be replaced, we also know that that happens in certain cases, that could actually hold at work as a scaffolding to basically insert proteins and into the right spot. Now, the same rationale can be applied when you actually look at tissues. So for instance, you could have cells that are um, uh, with their known spatial location, which have which are either old or young, and then these cells could be placed in specific regions of the tissue that basically guide or determine the function of relatively younger cells. Now, for the pancreas specifically, this is one. This is our leading model: is that basically these long-lived cells are able to affect the function of young, young beta cells. And again, this is, a, this is a hypothesis. This is what in the lab, what we're working to test. But basically that these, because these cells were actually born during the period when beta cells were maturing to achieve a adult functional phenotype, we believe that these cells could hold some kind of functional profile that would then uh, uh, dictate what uh, relatively younger beta cells, which by definition were not born during the developmental time, should actually um, achieve. And then basically what, you know, the old beta cell would be the, the gold standard of a adult beta cell that younger beta cells should uh, uh, follow and, and try to imitate. But then what we also don't know is what's the contribution of these long-lived beta cells to cell senescence. We don't understand whether the, um, right now, whether the relatively younger beta cells or whether these largely post-mitotic beta cells have a higher or lower tendency to become senescent. This, this is another project that we're studying in the lab. But then also most importantly, what's the molecular signature of, of these aging beta cells? And, and, and one of the things that it's, it's um, currently under in, in revision from the lab and it's funded by, by, uh, by the DKNet is actually a manuscript where we try to establish the molecular architecture of aging beta cells in non-diabetic donors. But the same concept that I just uh, uh, talked about can be applied during beta cell development early on where we know that developing beta cells, they are generated from neurogenin-3 uh, cells in the progenitor niche. And we know that these beta cells 
once they delaminate, they need to go out into the pancreas mesenchyme and form islets. Now, one possibility is that these um, new beta cells that are being born very early on, they will follow cues that are basically hedged on longevity. So we know that these cells can use the extracellular matrix to, 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 to migrate. We know that there are morphogens that can bind to extracellular matrix, and then there are morphogens that become long-lived morphogens once they're bound to the extracellular matrix. So it's very possible that beta cells, even though they are proliferating early in life, that they use long-lived elements to find their place in the developing pancreas. And one hypothesis is that actually once these primordial beta cells arrive where the islet is gonna be formed, it's possible that you might have one or two beta cells that becomes long-lived and serves as an anchor to, uh, um, to relatively younger beta cells that are either proliferating in place or other beta cells that are doing the same track. So with that, I'll thank you for, for the attention. I'll thank the members of my lab and uh, uh, my, my collaborators and my funding agencies, uh, and especially the, the, um, the DKNet for helping me and um, learning actually how to code and, and, and have a chance to actually learn new things. Thank you. Thank you, Rafael. A great presentation. So now it's our uh, Q and A session. Uh, you could uh, raise your hand or uh, use the chat function to ask questions. That was an excellent uh, talk. Really fascinating um, and just spectacular work on the microscopy. Um, I spent many years with Mark Ellisman. He was my postdoctoral advisor, and I looked up your papers. I'm like, because those looked like some of the things that. Uh, <laughs> Tom and Mark were working on. Uh, and it's really fascinating to me. You sort of answered my question at the end, which is, of course, a characteristic of any biological uh, grouping of organisms, as you have some very young, some in prime, some in the middle, some very old, and that the elders, right, create this very important uh, reservoir <laughs> of, of knowledge. Of knowledge. And it seems like this is recapitulating itself all the way down. Um, is, is there any evidence, uh, you may have um, you know, you sort of touched on this, about what the sort of prime functioning age is in a, in a cell? Like, do you do better if you have more long live cells or less, or well, is there any way to know? Uh, yeah, well, that's a very good question. And, and, and that's something that, that we're actively looking for. I mean, we're trying to find ways to enrich, you know, basically see if we can change the composition of young versus uh, long-lived cells in the, in in data cells, right? Because I, I so um, so far uh, we believe that the if you have longer living data cells, they tend to be more stable and therefore less likely to acquire um, you know um, uh, uh, cell division related damage. Um, but uh, right now, you know, I I I think our data is leading that way, but um, I still don't have the data to you know, answer that question with 100% confidence. But I, I think that um, we found ways to enrich for long-lived beta cells. And so far, it looks like having more older cells um, tends to work better for you. But um, you know, this is in mice. Um, now, yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, that, I, I, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> And then I see there is a question from the chat. Um, do you know if long-lived beta cells have a specific transcriptional signature? Oh yeah, so so we're also actively looking for that. Um, so as I said, we we have a way to enrich for long-lived beta cells. So we were actively doing now uh, single cell seq um, to try to get an overall view of the transcriptional uh, architecture of, of an islet that has predominantly long-lived cells, but that also we developed other ways to do um, uh, immunohistochemistry uh, on N15 labeled tissue that then you're able to overlay with the isotope data. So we're uh, adding on a new modality to this, which is um, related to electron microscopy. Like we, you, you, you could, potentially take a section of any pancreas, do your immunohistochemistry on it, and then look at it with electron microscopy or just go from the confocal microscope to the isotope microscopy and then basically overlay molecular signatures with age. Okay. 
and that's that's the approach that we're taking to to, to look at that. Okay, great. Um, there is another question from the chat. Um, how do you determine the position of long-lived and uh, young cells in the tissue? Oh uh, yeah, good, good good question. So um, so as I said, all this is correlate you know correlative and spatially annotated. So basically, every cell or even every pixel in each image has an address, right? So it has an X and Y coordinate. So now we're, we're actually using uh, spatial uh, analysis tools to pinpoint the position of these cells and test whether they are in specific regions or if they tend to be randomly distributed throughout the eyelid, or even if they tend to be in clusters. So uh, we're, we're looking into that right now. Okay, 